Good afternoon. Good afternoon, all. My name is Damon Watkins. I am the Director of Finance and Operations for Cal Poly CIE, and welcome to today's SBDC QuickBooks Intermediate Session. Just a couple of key points that I want to touch on in regards to what Madison was talking about. Um, this program is run by the Small Business Administration, and we have a number of programs that we offer through grants that we're able to assist our local community. If you are not an SBDC client, please consider signing up. It is completely free of charge and gives you direct access to a number of consultants that specialize in specific fields that might relate to your business. Again, these are all completely free of charge and offered to our local community through the SBDC directly. With that said, let's jump right into QuickBooks. This is my QuickBooks Intermediate session, so let's just have a brief review of what took place in our beginners class. So my beginning class with QuickBooks is really just making sure that I take you from a point where you have no knowledge of QuickBooks to where we have it installed. We have a chart of accounts set up, we have our vendors set up, we have our customers set up, and we have our bank links. Those are the four primary objectives that I like to achieve when um, I'm going through the process of the beginner's class. Um, if at any time during this session today you have any questions, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. For the individuals that are in person here, same scenario. This is very much an interactive session as much as possible. The reason I bring this up is with everything that I will be showing you today, it does come down to what the needs of your businesses are and what your understanding of QuickBooks and finance is. And so there's a direct relationship that exists between the two. So as I go through things today, don't hesitate to raise your hands and ask questions as it relates to your business. With that said, there is understandably a situation that can arise where at the end of the session, I have not answered all your questions. That's why I've left an hour at the end of this session. This actual presentation only takes about 90 minutes to two hours. And we will have about an hour afterwards if there are specific questions that relate to your business. If I can't answer the questions in that period of time, we can also do a one-on-one -on -one session. I do a number of counselings for the SBDC relating to QuickBooks and work with a number of different businesses at different stages. So again, if this class doesn't answer your questions and I'm not able to facilitate answering them after the class, we can always set up a one-on-one -on -one session. <clears throat> with that said, Let's jump right into QuickBooks and start looking at some of the areas that we're going to touch on today. Um, keeping in mind that we have the basis for the QuickBooks introduction session and having our customers and vendors set up. A couple of items that we will be touching on today is going about invoicing our clients, running collections, managing cash flow, setting up vendors and customers in the process that should be utilized. With that said, again, if there's anything additional you want to touch on, please let me know. The one subject I try to stay away from today is taxes. I do do two tax classes for more advanced sessions towards the end of the year. The reason I bring up taxes is specific is they can be very specific to the business entity and the type of business you're dealing with. And so it tends to send us down a little bit of a rabbit hole if we start talking about taxes. Again, with that said, I'd be more than willing to sit down with you afterwards or possibly do a one-on-one -on -one session. Before I move forward, any questions in regards to anything that I've just spoken about? Otherwise, let's jump right on in. Okay. So learning objectives with QuickBooks today and dealing with QuickBooks online specifically, signing into QuickBooks, the QuickBooks dashboards, three ways to navigate through QuickBooks and how QuickBooks is built and the transaction entry. You see my screen? How about now? Okay, sorry about that. Question in the chat, did you mention inventory information provided? Yes, we, we can touch on inventory control systems. Um, absolutely, that's not a problem at all. Um, if you could kind of give me an idea of the business that we're dealing with, whether you're a winery, whether you're a farmer, 
Um, it will help me with understanding the inventory and being able to explain it and articulate it within QuickBooks. QuickBooks has a very robust inventory control system. So um, absolutely, we can spend some time talking about that towards the end. A couple of key points before we jump into what's on the screen currently. I just want to make one thing really, 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 really clear. The most important aspect of QuickBooks and the information on hand is the quality of information that you put into QuickBooks. Well, what do you mean by the quality of information? There's an old saying within QuickBooks that dates back about 30 years. It's garbage in and then it's garbage out. I can't state to you how important it is to make sure that all relevant transactions are clearly documented and tracked correctly within QuickBooks and that they are attached to the correct item coding. We will spend some time today talking about item coding and specific class transactions that you are able to attract specific expenses against. And tell you the amount of time I run into people who run QuickBooks for a period of time, come running into my office and say, please help me clean it up and fix it. And I start to go through the transactions and everything has just been dumped into unclassified, which is great if you want everything to look clean, but it means that nothing is being communicated back from a financial perspective as to where your business is spending money, what it is spending money on. And if you don't know where your money is being spent and what you're spending it on, you cannot plan for future growth in any way. That's one of the key concepts of QuickBooks is it gives you a clear understanding from a financial perspective where your business is at, what your cash flow looks like, what your inventory system looks like, and in turn enables you to plan for growth and growing your business down the line since you'll be managing your cash flow more easily. At its core, QuickBooks is a cash flow management system giving you clear and concise information on where you're at financially. But again, it simply does not work unless the quality of information that is being put into the system is done correctly and is set up correctly. That's why I spend so much time in the, in the beginner's class going over ensuring that we have our vendors set up correctly and our customers. And when I mean have them set up correctly, having the W9s on file, having the relevant information relating to the contact points, the address of record and the contact information. This means that you're invoicing your customers faster, being paid faster, which helps you manage your cash flow. It also means that you have direct inter interaction with your vendors. You're paying your vendors on time, which is keeping your vendors happy, which in turn supports you from a transactional perspective as it relates to your customers. Are you monitoring the chat? So, what did we learn from my brief three minute session there? Is no matter what I teach you today, on how to go about doing the work, the most important aspect is putting it in correctly, taking the time and the due diligence. So let's talk about that really quickly. Okay, one of the key areas that I focus on in the beginning of this class, and I wanna make sure everyone is really clear, is making sure things like the bank feeds are set up correctly, okay? We have the ability now to directly link to the bank side of transactions. This is a huge benefit to small businesses out there. It means that you're not having to take your bank statement and correlate that information over into QuickBooks, sitting there manually plugging it in. With the bank link established, the system is able to map those transactions over at midnight, every single night. So you simply need to come in in the next morning and code those transactions to either the necessary vendors slash customers, depending on whether you're receiving a payment or sending a payment out. But the key aspect to that, again, is making sure that the vendors are set up and the, quest and the customers are set up correctly so that you can tag them. The other part about this that I wanna make really clear is once you have this process set up correctly, QuickBooks will actually adapt and learn. And once you code a specific transaction into a specific vendor and or a customer, it will remember it the next time. So you won't have to go through the same process, but all you'll have to do is confirm the transaction, which will clearly give you the information relating to where it's being coded and what it's being coded for. So again, keep in mind, no matter what we go through today, unless you're taking the time and the effort to do your due diligence, follow up on your bank fees, reconcile your bank account at the end of each month, going back to the one source of truth, none of what I talk about is going to matter. It has to be an all-encompassing perspective when it comes to the finances as it relates to your business. Threw a whole lot at everyone right there, understandably. As the questions mull around in your head, put your hand up and ask them. Because again, all of this is gonna be based on your understanding and how it relates to your business. We do have a small enough group today that if you do have specific questions as we make our way through, please just put your hand up. 
ask the question so we can answer it because what will start to happen is you'll start to gain an understanding of what it's going to look like in your world and that's a big part of what I'm trying to do here today. Okay. So just a couple of high level items relating to QuickBooks Online. It is recommended that you use Google Chrome with it when you're utilizing it online. Google Chrome seems to be a little bit more stable. Uh, personally speaking, I don't use IE at all for it anymore. Um, crazy to think a company that's owned by Microsoft doesn't run as effectively on their, their, their browsers per se. Um, the Chrome browser can be used on both Mac and Windows. It tends to be a little bit more stable when utilizing it. Um, just a recommendation, one of the worst case scenarios that can happen is you're plugging away information on there and the Internet Explorer locks up for you. You have to close it down to get it open again. Unfortunately, in those scenarios, you tend to lose the information, which again is why the recommendation is that you use Chrome. Okay, at this point in time, I'm pretty sure everyone knows how to go ahead and sign into QuickBooks Online, so I'm not gonna walk through the process of doing that. Um, what I am gonna do is basically go back and talk about what that dashboard looks like. And I'm sure. My screen so we can talk through it. I am. Actually, thank you for bringing them up. Let me, uh, I will touch on that in a second right here. Yeah, you don't need to take, thank you for bringing that up. I should have mentioned that. You get me to your main dashboard of anyone. <clears throat> so, uh, before I get started on our dashboard, um, I do want to let everyone know that the document that I will be going through today and using is the training guide associated with Intuit. I will be sending an entire copy of it out after this, including a training regimen that I use to manage all three of the classes. So you will have all the content that I use to teach these classes for both the beginners, the intermediate, and the advanced. You do not need to take any notes whatsoever, not one bit. Both documents will come directly out to you, including the PowerPoint that I'm working off right now. I really want you guys to focus on the content and not taking notes. That way I can make sure that I'm answering any questions you may have. And we're dealing with the situation uh, at hand, not you having to take notes on what's taking place. So, the dashboard. I don't like to spend too much time here, but I do want to emphasize how important this page is. Um, and specifically, really, it's your navigation point to every point within within QuickBooks. In particular, I like the fact that this page can be customized to your business needs to reflect exactly what you're looking at. In my case, one of the primary things that I use QuickBooks for from a cash flow standpoint um, is to monitor my AR, my AP, and I'm going to get a, a bit into that in a bit more detail, but what does that mean to your side of the world? Well, let's talk about that really quickly. We've got QuickBooks set up. We're doing our bank fees. We're, we're tagging our transactions that are coming in. We talked about the fact that primarily QuickBooks is utilized to manage the cash flow along with the transactions with your customers and vendors. But how does that relate to your week-to-week -week operations? One of the key aspects of growing any business out there is managing cash flow. Cash coming in, cash coming out. The idea being that there is more cash coming in than there is cash going out. Thus, we have a viable company that can grow. Not always the case. Right. And so being able to manage that on a weekly basis is what enables you to keep your doors open, the lights on and to be able to pay your employees. Now, to give you an example, before we dive too deep into this, I just want you to understand how scalable QuickBooks is. Before I worked for Cal Poly, I worked for a rather large solar company up in Slope called REC Solar. And while I was there, we managed a $250 million budget out of QuickBooks. We were in 36 states, managed about 18 different projects. Average invoice billing was about $12 million a week. And the reason I throw all these big numbers at you is I want you to understand that QuickBooks is completely scalable to what you're doing. There's not much that you can throw out there that QuickBooks will not be able to handle as it relates to your business. If it can run a $250 million budget in multiple states, multiple task districts, trust me when I tell you it can handle whatever you have out there. A lot of people have this perception that it's really just for small businesses. And when I get to a certain size, that is not the case. 
So getting to know QuickBooks as well as possible is in your best interest for not only yourself, but your business as well as you manage it. One of the things I always recommend is as it relates to your business, you have to be the expert when it comes to QuickBooks, which is why you come see me so I can help you become the expert at QuickBooks as it relates to your business. With that said, let's dive right into what the dashboard means to you and why it's so important. One of the aspects I really like about the dashboard is the ability to customize the look and the feel of it so that when you're coming in on a daily basis or weekly basis, you have a clear understanding of what is taking place, whether that's invoicing a client as is highlighted in here or the expectation of receiving a payment from a customer. Really have a clear, concise understanding of where things are relating to your business and the cash flow is going to give you the best opportunity from a growth perspective moving forward. You also have the ability within here to review transactions related to your bank feed, generate set reports, which we will spend some time talking about the reporting aspects of QuickBooks, as it is one of the most robust portions of QuickBooks. Do understand, as we proceed through here, that there are limitations associated with QuickBooks online versus QuickBooks desktop, right? And we will touch on them because invariably, a lot of companies start going down this path where they want to use QuickBooks for financial planning purposes and forecasting purposes, possibly for investment down the line. QuickBooks online is not completely geared towards that side of the world where QuickBooks desktop is. It has it's the reporting system within the QuickBooks desktop side is a little bit more robust and customizable. So if there is a, a belief that down the line you're going to be looking to, towards investment within your company and you're going to want to be doing more strategic financial planning, I would recommend that you consider migrating to the desktop version. I put that right up front right now as it relates to QuickBooks because once you start working within QuickBooks online, it's very hard to transition it to desktop, where if you started right now with desktop, it won't be an issue. Conversely speaking, it is very easy to migrate from the desktop version to the online version. It is not so easy to migrate from the online version back to the desktop. Please keep that in mind. If you do wish to have a further discussion about this, let me know um, or raise your hand per se. Okay, the dashboard. So again, we've talked about the fact that the dashboard is your landing spot for your company. You can customize this specific page to the needs of your business and what it looks like from a cash flow perspective or how you want to see this information as it relates to departments. You may have specific employees working for you that you want to give certain access to. You have the ability to customize the, and limit their access. Conversely speaking, you may have an employee that's working within accounts payable. You don't want them to see payroll as an example. You can limit the access that they have and what they can view on the dashboard, keeping certain information private as it relates to your business and your employee. You also have the ability to set up multiple users within QuickBooks. This is something that most companies that are looking to grow that have a depart multiple departments or multiple individuals that are working within QuickBooks that, that they can utilize. You can also limit their access and how they can go about accessing QuickBooks. Okay? Each one of these additional users, there is a cost associated with it. Um, QuickBooks has a tier system where it's three users, six users, nine users, 12 users and so on and so forth. Again, great way to manage your team, limit the, uh, the uh, interactions that they can have with QuickBooks, but create a system that works for your business from a business flow perspective. Okay, any questions about the dashboard? It is pretty straightforward. I do recommend people take some time to get familiar with it and customize it to your needs. Again, this is your landing, plot, landing spot. This is where you're going to land every single time you come into QuickBooks. Absolutely. Okay, so I just uh, signed up mm -hmm. and I uh, linked my credit card and my bank account. Okay. To, I, I, it's showing on my dashboard at 99 plus transactions. Mm -hmm. So I suppose it wanted me to code those. And since it's so new, that's why I've got that name. Correct. So I'm going to repeat the question so everyone can hear it real quick, and then I'm going to walk you through why that's happening and then your choices along the way. So I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Randy. Randy, Randy just mentioned that he just linked his QuickBooks online up to his credit card and his bank account, 
And he just looked back in and he has 99 transactions pending basically out there. So what that means to Randy really is that the system has gone back to his bank and it's actually more than likely pulled the last three months with their transaction history because that's the default and pulled all that information into QuickBooks Online and now is looking for Randy to code that information. So a couple of points here. Part of the reason I talked about in the beginning of class that we set up the vendors and the customers, everything that Randy is seeing in that feed from the bank relates to two different types of entities, either the customer or a vendor that you're dealing with. So either you're paying someone or someone is paying you. The key aspect of this is number one, do we have all the vendors, the people that we are paying set up in QuickBooks correctly so that when you go into those 99 transactions, you can say Home Depot, Costco, cleaning materials for the business so that you can capture and track those expenses correctly. That's why I talked about making sure you had your vendors set up and that the category code, supplies and material, paper, office material are set up. So it's simply a matter of you taking that transaction and tagging it to the appropriate vendor who in turn would be set up with the correct GL code. That's number one. Number two, when you went through that process of actually linking up, and this is going to be my recommendation to everyone, when you go through the actual process within QuickBooks of linking the account, one of the windows that pops up right before you hit link is it asks you how far back you want to pull data in. And a lot of people miss this window, right? So the question I pose to you is, how far back do you want to go? And the way you want to look at this, right, is from a financial reporting period, okay? January 1st through December 31st. Now, if you're telling me all the business you've done this year relates to those bank accounts, then my recommendation to you was you're going to need to go back to January 1st, and we're going to need to clean up the whole year. So that when we get to the end of the year and I do my tax class, you're going to be ready to file. Because if we do what I'm talking about right now, at the end of this year, you're going to be able to file yourself because everything will be dictated and entered correctly in QuickBooks it's simply a matter of generating the reporting. But the key aspect is making sure that we've captured all those transactions. This is something we're going to spend time talking about is the revenue side versus the expense side, right? The biggest mistake small businesses make, especially startup, is the inability, and this is going to sound crazy, but the inability to capture their true expenses associated with their business. There's a mindset that comes along with being an entrepreneur that's we can do this, we can take this, I'm gonna put it on my back and I'm gonna shovel through. So no matter what it is, perspective wise, you're gonna push your business forward and strive to achieve that. But the belief is I have to take the expenses and I have to eat them personally. I don't wanna put it on the business. You are hurting your business if you do not capture all your expenses. At its baseline, revenue, right, is sales minus expenses. If you're not capturing all your expenses, you're going to be paying more taxes than you need to be, and your business is not going to be as profitable. So I can't emphasize how much, how important it is to capture. When I work with the accelerator teams over the summer, these are teams from Cal Poly that we award money for that have businesses that are looking to become viable. The biggest lesson I have to get them to understand at the beginning is they need to capture every expense. They're walking out the door and getting in a car and driving to a business meeting with a customer. That trip is a business expense from the moment you walk out that door. 53 cents a mile, tracked. You had lunch with them, that's a business expense, okay? It's not a personal expense. Those expenses need to be in QuickBooks. Having that mindset and getting yourself to understand these expenses all need to be in QuickBooks. Not just some of them, but all of them. So that you have a clear understanding of where your money is being expensed towards. Right? Get to the end of the year and we start budget planning for the next year. If you are not capturing those expenses and categorize them correctly, how can you plan for the growth of your company? Not having a clear picture of where they are at financially. It's little things like these as it relates to QuickBooks that make the difference when it comes to your business. It's not to me showing you how to set up a vendor in QuickBooks, but having the understanding that I should be capturing every single little expense as it relates to my business. Which means those individual employees yeah. need to be included. So the employees, it, it depends. So good question. <clears throat> um, employees should be set up under either payroll or as independent contractors. 
either side of the world. If they're employees and they walk out that door and they do something for the business, they should be reimbursed, which will be a reimbursable to the business, which is an expense. Your independent contractors, these are people that you deal with that are not employees, but work for your business and they have a specific scope of work, right? Same situation again. The only difference is they are not reimbursable. They will invoice you for any associated work that is an expense to the business, right? And that's the difference between the two. An independent contractor is doing work for you, but he is not on payroll. It's clear defined scope of work that he does, right? And he has paid a set amount for that work. That is an expense. And that's the benefit to you where payroll isn't necessary. It's an expense tied to the business, but it's not a direct expense like working with an independent contractor. Does that make sense? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. And so this is something we touched on on the first part of the, cl of the class when I did my beginner's class is that when you go to set the, the, the let me make sure, when you go to set the vendor up, there is a box within the vendor setup that says 1099. It is key, it is key that you have the W9 on file to be able to generate the 1099. This is something that gets lost on people and it can be, it, that liability ends up falling back on you. So here's a situation you wanna make always be clear. If you are dealing with an independent contractor and you are paying the independent contractor, the, the liability associated with any tax reporting is not on you anymore. It is now on that individual. But if you don't have that W-9 on file and you can't generate the 1099 at the end of the year, the IRS says it's your liability. So that's why it is so important that you get that 1099 with either their social or tax ID on file as a vendor so that the end of the year, come January 30th, when we're generating those 1099s, you're gonna get a whole long list of it. Three ply piece of paper that comes off on those 1099s. One's yours, one goes to the independent contractor, and one goes to the IRS. That's how they're able to validate that information, is they have three sources. And trust me when I tell you, they will come after you if you're not doing it correctly, okay? They really will. So make sure you have those W-9s on file as it relates to independent contractor. Make sure they're signing the agreement. Make sure you're documenting all of this as it relates to your business. And there we went down a rabbit hole. <laughs> and that's what we do because it relates to your business, right? And, and so it's really, really important that these, again, what I'm gonna show you today is just how to do it. The way you go about it is the most important part of what you will take away from this experience. I mean. Setting up a customer is not that hard, but making sure that that box is checked that says 10, 1099 and making sure that you have that W9 on file is key. Mm -hmm. you don't need the so, so yes, so to, to answer your question more directly in what you were actually really asking me is you were asking me if, if we're going to reimburse our employees, do we do it through payroll or do we do it through vendor side of things? And the answer to your question is it depends. If you're using QuickBooks payroll system, it will do it for you automatically. Okay, which means it will process that reimbursement through payroll. If you're managing payroll internally and doing it yourself because you have a very small team, then I would recommend that you do set them up as a vendor. It, it's a clear way to keep them in two separate worlds as it relates to the reimbursable versus salary side of things. The QuickBooks module for payroll is an additional expense associated with QuickBooks Online that you pay on a monthly basis per user, right? That will handle the reimbursable side. But not everyone wants to get QuickBooks payroll just for that reason alone. And it is an additional expense. So to answer your question, if you're not using QuickBooks payroll, yes, you would utilize them under the vendor system, and then you would basically pay them out in that manner. But you would only do that for reimbursables. Uh, I did wanna just jump into the vendor side, the vendor screen really quickly, because we, we've spoken so much about it. I'm, I'm gonna spend like 30 seconds going over this. So this is actually the new vendor screen that you can see. 
again, making sure that you're taking the time to document and get everything as up to date as possible, make sure life's that much easier as you move forward. The key aspect of actually what I wanted to show here is the box that everyone misses. And the reason they miss it is because before on QuickBooks desktops, when it went to set up a vendor, the checkbox for 1099 was right at the top here next to name and contact. But we all know how people love to update systems and improve them. And in their update and improving them, guess where do you think they put that box? Right at the very bottom, right here. So unless you knew to go to additional info section, and here's that magical box sitting right there, track payments for 1099 purpose. Right. And so the reason they did this is they tied it to having the tax ID or the social security number on file, which is what you would need, which is why I spoke about the W-9, because that information would be on the W-9 that you then would be able to input in here, which would enable you then to generate the 1099s on January 30th of next year. So this is the most important box if we are looking to generate 1099s. If we don't have 1099s, if we don't have a W-9 on file, though, this is why I say before you send that first payment out in any way for any work being done, you have to get that W-9 on file. Because here's what happens, right? They do work for you, and you go, shoot, I forgot to get in the W-9. <clears throat> hey, can I get the W-9 for you? Uh, I'm not doing any more work for you this year, so no. You think it doesn't happen? It happens. And the real relevant information. Tax ID, name, and address. So the, the, the thing that you're going to derive from it, other than the relevant information relating to the tax ID or the Social Security number, is if they're an individual or an entity. Okay? That's what the W-9 tells you right away. And, and the reason I bring that up is you may have a sole prop, a sole proprietor who's operating under a social, or you're dealing with an entity, a C Corp, an S Corp, an LLC, which is under a tax ID number. No, you do not. You do not. But but the point being that you'll know what kind of an entity you're dealing with. Is it just a, a one man show or am I actually dealing with the business itself? And and that that opens up another whole can of worms, right? Uh, license, insurance, blah, 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 blah. And so, again, having that on file, you have a better understanding of who you're working with and the individual or the entity that you're dealing with directly. Yeah, uh, and they've attested to it by signing on that document. And again, it is. It is a CYA to protect yourself. The onus is on them to do the filings. And the way that you ensure you're protected is the 1099, right? Because any payments that you have issued out to them, they are responsible for reporting on. The only way the IRS are going to know that, though, is through the 1099. And that's why we get three different copies, right? They validate that information. They validate your information when they, you do your return against the 1099. They validate it against the information that the independent contractors using and then they get a copy themselves and so trust me the reason they do that and i've worked in this long enough and dealt with both the irs and the BOE, is they validate that information and they look for patents which is why the consistency with which you go about doing your business how you file and when you file is really important as well again kind of touched on taxes and jumped into that rabbit hole as well but again, I, I do want to paint a clearer picture of what the expectation is from, from your perspective, and most importantly, what the liability is if you do, do something like this. So again, just make sure you're getting that W-9 on file. It's going to have all the relevant information that you need to, to be dealing with that. And you should be doing that in general, dealing with vendors, is making sure that you do have that W-9 on file. QuickBooks does have the ability to store these documents within the setup. You see this add attachment. So one of the things you don't want to do is have piles and piles of W-9s lying in your office, right? They're considered confidential information. They should be under lock and key. Here's what I do. I download the W-9 from the IRS website. It's a fillable Adobe document. I send it to my vendors. They complete it online. They send me back this nice completed document, which is digitally signed or physically signed. I simply attach it in here. It's not sitting in a file cabinet. If I need that document, it's right there for me, okay? Paperless. You can catch anything you want to it. Mm-hmm. 
you're going to put that W9 in is what you're going to do. You're just physically going to take that document and plug it in there as a reference point. And uh, later on, you might go back and go, oh, man, did I plug in the right Social Security number, tax ID number? Did I have the right entity name? Instead of going digging through a filing cabinet or unlocking the key box to open it up, you just click on the attachment and boom, it's there. And, and this proceeds onwards too, right? I mean, like when I was run, working at REC, oh my goodness, we were getting you know 60 bills a day that were being processed through the system. I, I would have every single invoice attached within QuickBook for every entry that I had. Because I had rooms as big as this with cabinets filled with what? Invoices. And I have to keep seven years of them, right? So you can imagine how big something... Now imagine that all of those documents I can simply attach within QuickBooks for each transaction. As long as, and these days, most of your invoices are coming via email anyway. So it's simply a matter of dragging a PDF over, attaching it, plugging the information. Boom, shred. Okay. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a room full of paper. Whether it's your invoices or invoices from vendors sending them to you, this is how the cycle starts. The other point is it's quick and easy to reference. You get a customer or a vendor calling you up, two months ago, I saw this. You go into the invoice, there's it. Let me actually look at what you sent me, click. It's right there in front of you as you have them on the phone. Customer service side, okay? Can't overstate how important it is the level of service you provide to your customer. Not just vendors, but customer side of it too, right? The ability to provide that information right away, it's right there. You're not digging through files, you're not looking enables you to provide better quality service to both the vendors you're dealing with and your customers as well as it relates to this. Yeah. Yeah, you can do DBAs too. Mm -hmm. So you would traditionally have the company name and the company name and the vendor display name might be, it might be Bob Jones's plumbing. Right, and it's Bob Jones. So it, again, it, just take the time to get familiar with it, setting it up correctly, making sure all the relevant information is there. So later on, it, you're not having to worry about all of this. Again, this is the foundation that you're gonna build everything on. So if it's not set up correctly, you're only making more work for yourself later on. Okay, let me pause here, We're 45 minutes in. I just wanna make sure, any questions so far? No? No, there was just, um, Carlene was, had chimed in earlier with the inventory question. Mm -hmm. She just, um, promise you I will get to the inventory. She filled in on what she is focused on. So we can get to that when we, uh, when we get there. Okay, <laughs> let's get back out and we, and we will touch on the inventory system. Get back into my document. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So we talked about dashboard. Um, I didn't go too far into the other areas. I did talk, basically talk about the reporting side of things. You can customize it to have a basic profit and loss report that will show up on that screen if you want, where the system is constantly updating it based on the feeds that it's getting from the bank, from your ability to invoice your customers. It'll manage your cash flow and tell you exactly where you're at from a cash flow. It'll monitor your AR, your accounts receivable. It'll monitor your AP, your accounts payable. In turn, that's going to be the two primary vehicles that you utilize to manage your cash flow. So, mm -hmm. sure. No. It, so, when I talk about AR and AP from a cash management, it's not so much the recognition of revenue, but it's actually managing cash flow. What do I mean by that? So I'll give you an example and we can work backwards from there. So when I was at REC Solar, it just talked about the fact that, you know, $250 million company, we invoiced at about $12 million a week based on our projects or about 48 to $50 million a month, roughly. But we would also be paying out about $6 million to $7 million a week in expenses, right? So from my perspective, as I worked with the CFO, it was vital from a management perspective that I always had a clear understanding of what my cash flow was on a weekly basis. If I'm invoicing out 12 and paying seven, right? The problem at hand is the vendors that I'm paying have net 30 terms. 
The people that I'm getting my payments from have net 90 terms, right? Where's the issue here? Well, it means I have a 60 day window gap that exists between when I'm billing the customer and when I'm receiving payments. So literally every Monday I would come in and I would go into my accounts receivable reporting and I would run my AR for the next week. And for people out there that aren't, uh, don't know what the word AR means, it's accounts receivable. It's payments that I expect to receive in for that period of the week that I've invoiced those customers for. I would run my AR. Okay, I'm expecting to get 19 million in this week. Great. I, exactly. Or depending on what their terms were, right? And I would run my AP, what I am due to pay out this week. Okay, my AP says 9 million. Okay, so now I have a clear understanding of what I'm supposed to receive in and what I'm supposed to pay out. So now I go to my collection guys, and I'm like, we're good, right? We're collecting these, yes, no problem, all those payments are coming in. Your business is exactly the same. There's no difference, right? You're going in Monday morning, you're coming into QuickBooks, you've plugged all your bills in, you've been getting them, you plug them in, you run that report, you plug in Monday's date, you plug it all the way through Sunday and you hit run. The system generates and goes, okay, $7,000 is due by next Monday. Okay, that's great, so I need to pay those. Run it by Friday, right? Make sure those are paid. But now I need to go and understand how much I'm actually getting in from the vendors, uh, the customers that I've invoiced. And I run that report and I realize I'm only getting five and a half thousand in this week. We have a negative cash flow scenario. Not a problem, right? Because we knew when we were forecasting that this might happen and we have cash in the, in the bank account to absorb that. But the only way that works is if you know it. It doesn't work is if you get to Friday and you go to pay your bills and you go, oh, okay, I'm gonna pay everything now. Okay, $7,000, how much is in the bank? $5,000, oh, shit, okay? Because guess what your vendors don't wanna hear? I can't pay you, right? And so managing that relationship between cash flow coming in and cash flow coming out is the lifeblood of your business. Nothing, nothing will shut your doors faster than not managing cash flow. With that said, what's the single biggest hurdle that small businesses, and this is an absolute statistical fact, the single biggest hurdle that startups battle with in the first three years and will close that door faster than anything is? So understanding what that relationship is, how it relates to your business. Now let's take it a step further, right? How can we manage that relationship that we just talked about from a cash flow without outlaying any additional cash? Because there's a way. People just don't know what the process is, right? So you go to a vendor, brand new customer, brand new company, just started up. I got my new candle store on Grand Avenue. I pick up the phone. I call a wax supplier. I go, I'm a new candle store in Arroyo Grande. I'm making candles. Sell me wax. Okay, how much you want to buy? I want to buy 50 pounds of wax. 50 pounds of wax, address. Can I get you a credit card? Sure, pay, done. Get the wax in, make your candles, send it out, make your money. One problem. When did you have to pay for the wax? When do you get paid by your customers? The distance between the two is a cash outlay that you have to account for. How do we overcome that? My gosh, we can overcome it? Absolutely we can. Just like you have credit score associated with you personally, so does your business. It absolutely does. Whether it's Dun & Bradstreet, which grades you against your ability to pay debt back, which is what credit means, right? Is your ability to pay debt back, not what you have in the bank, not how much you got, it's the ability to pay debt back. You interact with that vendor and you keep going back every month ordering that 50 pounds of wax, after two months, you're going to call them and go, can you give me net 30 terms, please? We've been working together for two months. I paid regularly. Sure. They give you net 30 terms. So now you get the wax. You got 30 days to make the candles, sell the candles before you have to pay that vendor back. Cash flow management, but using the credit side of it. Not credit in a credit card, but the ability to pay debt back. What happens after three months? We call that vendor back again. What do we ask them this time? Net 60. After six months, what do we call back and ask for? Net 90. 
What are you doing by increasing those terms with your vendors? Managing your cash flow, yes. But people don't make the association between the two. This is a key instrument that you can use to leverage a position that you might get to help you manage your cash flow. And what's, what do we already decide is the biggest hurdle you have to overcome? Managing your cash flow. So the next question goes, how do we speed the process up, Damon? We can, just gotta know how to do it. You gotta build your company credit. How do we build company credit? What's that? Bingo. How do we normally pay our bills right now? We just talked about it. We normally pay our bills by... Bingo! Oh, that's awesome. Okay, exactly right. So here's what we normally do, right, to build credit for our business. It's all transactional based. As we interact with other vendors, vendors grade us, and they do, just so we're clear. And over time, lots of time, you build credit. It can take six, nine, 12 months for that to occur. How can we expedite that process? Really easy. It's called a credit card. But Damon, bank won't give me a credit card. I don't have any credit history. That is correct. So we're going to create some. You walk down to your bank, you pull out $500, and you say to them, I want a secured credit card for $500 with my business name. Hand it over. Every transaction that relates to the business, use that credit card. Three months later, you have a 680 credit score. That works. Right? And so what happens at the end of, the, of, of that 90-day period, or depending on your personal credit, will impact it, or the six-month period, what does the bank come to you and say? Hey, you know that $500 secured credit card? How about we give you a $2,000 unsecured credit? You don't need the $500 anymore. We, we, you, you've built credit. So now you have net 90 terms with your vendors. Okay? You have the secured credit line with the bank. Not credit to spend, but credit that affects the ability for your business to interact with those vendors and get better terms. But you also have a release mechanism should you need access to additional funds, i.e. your credit line. All these little things are not taught in QuickBooks. There's no manual that you're going to find what I just told you. But all of these instruments can be used to help you manage and overcome cash flow scenarios that you were encountered dealing with your vendors, and most importantly, managing your customers, because it's all about relationships from that side. So again, there's so much that I will show you today as we proceed through this, but it's these little things that relate to your business. And that's fine. I'm going to emphasize this again. You're going to get a lot out of my interaction today, but having those one-on-one -on -one sessions for me, giving me a better idea of what your business looks like, is where I can dive deeper down into these specific kinds of things to help you guys grow your business. Because I've been doing this for 27 years now, okay? I've seen every version of QuickBooks that you can imagine. And I've worked from companies that have zero dollars all the way up to half a billion dollar companies. And they all encounter the same issues. It's just on what scale they encounter it. But it's always, non I work for a nonprofit right now. I mean, I work for Cal Poly Corporation, which is the nonprofit arm of Cal Poly. That's how we're able to provide these programs like this, like the Summer Accelerator, the incubator program that we're able to run. We're supported by grants from the county, the city, um, and the SBDC runs five of those grants alone for almost half a million dollars. So yes, right? And this all comes together to be able to support our students and our local community. And I'm gonna be 100% honest with you, the, the lifeblood of our local community is small businesses like yours. They are. That's why we get to live in a beautiful place like this, enjoy everything that we have, but the lifeblood of our small community is businesses with 10 and less employees. It's not the big guys, it's just not, okay? It is the small businesses with 10 and less employees that generate the tax revenue for the county, for the state, and for our city. And so that's why it's so vitally important that we keep those jobs and we keep those businesses here in our local community and we see them become successful. Because when you become successful and you hire more people, you generate more tax revenue for the local community, which is what the driving force behind small communities. And it's not the big guys, guys. It's just not. It's the small businesses that are the lifeblood of our communities. It's the small businesses that give back more than the large business. And so that's why we are so focused on that part of our community, whether it's the student side and encouraging students to start out businesses and be here or working with small businesses like yourselves to ensure that they have the necessary resources to be successful within our community.
So you got me going down that rabbit hole. This this is one of my passions. Oh, please bring it on. Yes. Recognize it. So the good news is, is that's not your problem. It's your CPA's problem. Yeah, your 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 tracking of that those expenses and how you recognize them is done when you do your filing. When your CPA actually makes. Mm hmm. So, so all of them have to be in there. All the expenses, it has to be in there, irrespective. It's when they're recognized from a revenue side of things. And so irrespective, so that your CPA is going to take a look at this and decide at which point. And so do you, do you have a schedule that you're working off right now? Do you work with a CPA at this point? Yeah. Oh, okay. Then you, you, you get exactly what I'm saying here. So I guess the question would be how we go about setting it up so it's tracking those expenses, per se, and then when we would recognize it. And so I would want to spend a little bit more time with you to understand, first of all, the type of business you're dealing with, and then how we would go about it, but completely doable. I mean, I just spent two and a half months with a large, um, gosh, what are they, it's like a whole food, but they produce um, probiotic yogurts locally here. And he went from the similar scenario that you're talking about, where he went straight from a cash to an accrual, and he wanted to do it as of the first, and it basically had to map the whole of last year's back out. So completely doable, but I would want to have a bit more information as it relates to it. So we can sit down. Oh, no, no. Great question, though. I, and it, it does come up quite often. I do spend a lot of time going over um, cash or accrual in my tax class, only because it relates to it more on that side. But let's, if you're no, in no hurry after this, let's sit down and take a look at that together. With that said, see, this is what happens as we go down these paths. And I don't want to forget inventory, but we're going to get there. But a high-level review of QuickBooks, and I'm just going to spend 30 seconds on this because we've talked about it at nauseum today, I feel like, to a certain degree. So key things within QuickBooks that you just want to pay attention to. A list of information in QuickBooks, which is your chart of accounts and your item listings that's broken out. Um, do realize you want to become familiar with what that looks like and how it relates to your business. Number two, the transaction forms that are utilized. So this could be anything from your credits, your debits, your invoices, your bills, um, anything that relates to a transaction that's being entered into the system. Um, oh, I just jumped out there. And then lastly, but not least, the other reporting functions, um, reconciling budgets, et cetera, et cetera. I do want to start right here and talk about reconciling QuickBooks. This is one of the areas that whenever I bring this subject up, I get wide-eyed individuals going, oh my goodness, really, really? I know the word seems very intimidating. It's as easy as baking a pie, and I'm not even joking with QuickBooks, okay? You just need to get comfortable with doing it. Why is it so important? Here's the deal. You need to have one source of truth when it comes to QuickBooks. Right. And what does that mean? It means that when we look at QuickBooks from a transactional perspective, as it relates to money coming in and money coming out, what is our one source of truth? And you're like, well, what does that really mean, Damon? Well, what it really means is where can we go back to and validate every bit of information that is actually hitting QuickBooks? And the answer to the question is your bank, right? Now, here's the thing. We're all human, which means we all make mistakes, which means you're gonna make it. Okay? It's gonna happen. Just human. How do we catch mistakes? Catch mistakes by reconciling our books every month and tying back to the bank. Okay? I cannot overstate how important this is. The first question I ask people when they come to me and go, something's wrong. We spent months trying to figure it out. The first question I ask, the very first question, is not did you pay QuickBooks? Do you have all the information in there? Nope. I asked them, did you reconcile your books on a monthly basis? Because you know what? If you did, I can find that problem for you probably in like 15 minutes. If you haven't reconciled your books for the last year, probably can take me about a day. Okay? And the same goes for you. You're going to have a scenario where two, three months down the line, a customer is going to come back and go, this is not right. And you're going to go, but I tied it back to the bank statement. 
what's the deal? You're going to be able to find it. But if you didn't reconcile those books, it is going to take you days to figure these out. The most important aspect of closing out your month is reconciling. What does it mean? I'm going to make it super, super easy so nobody's intimidated. I can't tell you how many times I get this wide-eyed look. I sit people down and I walk them through the process as simple as possible. And they're like, oh, that's, that's not that hard. Here's what happens, guys. You get your bank statement. You click on reconcile within QuickBooks. It asks you for the beginning balance, which should have been the prior, year, prior month's balance. You plug it in, $1,000. It asks you for the closing balance, $5,000 which means throughout the month we have 4,000. It then looks at every transaction you have and it lists them out. And it finds a delta between the two, it highlights it. And so what the system will come back and say to you is actually there was $5,100. And so now you need to go find that $100. Now it could be something as simple as a check that was deposited that didn't get mapped over or an entry on your side, but there is no way to know until you walk through this process and ensure that you do go ahead and tie these things out. I cannot tell you how much time and effort it will save. On average, most people, it takes about 45 minutes to reconcile their books. Just for an average small business, average person, no experience. Take the time to do it. Here's the other aspect. You know your business. Nobody knows it better than you. Going through this process will help you understand where your money's been spent, where your money's been coming from, and what that cash flow scenario looks like. Nothing will paint a clearer picture than walking yourself through this process as a whole. Take the time to do the exercise. It can seem intimidating at first, but I promise you, it is a super, super easy process within QuickBooks. In fact, while I got you here, let's actually show you. Exactly the same. It's, in fact, it's even easier because of the way they've automated it. Repeat the comment or the question? Oh, yeah, there's a question? Just out loud. No, Which one? What she just said. I don't remember what I just well, there, said. There was a question about... No, no, how she said it's just like um, challenging a checkbook. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, Tom, I, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name again? Okay. Beth, Beth was just making the comment about reconciling it is just like balancing your checkbook, and it is. In fact, it's, it's easier than... Than, than balancing your, your checkbook, to be quite on to be quite honest with you. And Carmen said, I just got my QuickBooks, but I want to uh, reconstruct back to January 1st. Can you do that and reconcile each month? Yes. Yes, yeah, you absolutely can. Yeah, so you can specify the period of time that you go back. So you would much, like you were talking about earlier, you would go all the way back to January. It would pull all the data in from January, and then all you would do is generate the monthly statements and reconcile it on a monthly basis. In fact, can you see my screen? No. Let me share this real quick. So if you do that, you have to close out each month, each month before you go in and reconcile That is correct. That is absolutely correct. And And... And that's why the reason that's so important is, is something we haven't touched on, and I'm going to get to it because I'm showing you the reconcile screen, is, is the, the fact that once you close out a period and you reconcile it in the manner that we just talked about, you actually lock that period out. And that's really, really, really important, and I'll tell you why. If you're a, a company where it's not just you, right, you, you have employees, you have people that are making data entries, one of the things that tends to happen quite a bit if a vendor sends you a late invoice, it always happens, right? Oh, I, I didn't get paid on this. It was for, I don't know, something from Home Depot. And your little AP lady gets her bills in and she's plugging them away for this month. And all of a sudden she gets a bill from a vendor and it's for two and a half months ago. She goes, oh, okay, let me plug that in two and a half months ago. The moment she goes ahead and puts that back two and a half months ago, what is she going to do? She's going to undo everything you reconciled. And she's going to undo everything moving forward as well, right? Think about it. You tied it out. So if you don't reconcile and you don't lock the periods out, you start capturing these expenses in the periods that are not relevant to them. Now, I'm going to be honest here. Take a step back. We should be capturing expenses in the period that they happen. That is, that is vitally important. But if you've reconciled a period and a vendor gets you that invoice two and a half months late, plug it in the month that you're in. Do not backdate the invoice. 
right? This is one of the issues that arise if you don't reconcile. Then all of a sudden you're trying to dig through transactions to figure out why you're off. Well, you're off because she plugged a bill for two and a half months ago for a period that's already closed, which means every single reconsolidation you do moving from there is going to be off by that amount. Okay? Again, there's not a document out there that will tell you what I just told you, but it is part of understanding that. And, and then, um, Bingo. That's exactly right. So in, in my case, I would capture it in the period that we're in, and in the notes, I would reference that it relates to a different period, right? And I would state, uh, invoice dated March of 2023, only received in June. So that when, if a question came up and I, why did I pay it so late? I could go back. The invoice is attached. Remember, we attached the invoice, all our documents. I can see this invoice came in at this time. I can see it wasn't paid. I can see I paid it in this period, and here is why. Okay, let's take a look at the very intimidating reconsolidation because I did want to touch on this. So we talked about ending balance, right? And the ending date, the system already knows in this case because I reconciled the problem month. It knows what my beginning balance was. It's going to start looking at it, and let's just say it's, I won't pull my bank feed though. And basically it's gonna generate, it won't do it for me right now because my bank feed is not live, this is a demo, but it will basically generate a list for me and show me every transaction that totals up to what that balance is. It will highlight in red if it finds any deltas or differentials and it will let you know. And literally that's the process. It will tell you what you're off and it will tell you exactly how much you're looking for if you are off and there is a delta in there. So you're entering the bank's ending balance, mm -hmm. which might not show outstanding checks. Ah, uh, if you're if you're dealing with checks, you would need to account for that yourself. It, but again, uh, unless you have desktop deposit or de I mean, checks these days clear super quick. So I, you know, that, that's where you need to kind of work the system a little bit and have understanding. As it relates to checks, let's have a quick discussion about checks because this always comes up, um, especially on my side of the world. Um, two points when it comes to checks. Um, to make the reconsolidation process more streamlined, I do not recommend that you deposit your checks every day. Do not, no, makes your life a lot harder. A lot, 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 lot harder. This is what you should be doing. You should be depositing your checks once a week, right? Preferably Friday. You have to copy the check. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. So here's why I recommend this. When you go to reconcile, how many deposits are you going to have to look at? Just four. Just four. And that's where you can account for it. And when, I mean, you might write a check to a... You're still writing checks to pay bills? You can. Oh. Sure. I, I'm, I'm not judging. I'm just asking the question because it does. So then you would need to account for I don't encounter that very often. But but if you're writing a check, then the system knows it. it just, just because it hasn't been cashed doesn't mean the system doesn't know it. So the system knows when you wrote the check. Right? Are you writing them out of QuickBooks or are you manually writing them? Sure. Then that's perfect because if you're entering it in QuickBooks, the system knows the check has been issued and it also knows when the check has been cashed. Yeah. So that's the from that side of things, it will validate that. The, the area that you might run into is kind of what we talked about with the deposit side. So like your deposit is on the last day of the month, right? So remember any transactions that happen between midnight on Thursday do not actually clear the bank until, anybody know the answer? Midnight on Monday, okay? Anything you see transactional is actually a shadow posting. Nothing takes place. Midnight on Thursday through midnight on Monday. Everything, the, the transactions are taking place and they're what's known as shadow posting, but they're actually not being processed. So that's why it, it would affect your ability now. 
if you're going to bank on Friday afternoon at three o'clock and doing that deposit and then validating that deposit in QuickBooks, you're going to be fine, right? Because there's two sides to the QuickBooks deposit side. There's the bank side and then the, the deposit side of things as well. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah, awesome. You. You're welcome. Great question. Okay. Um, now that we talked about that, let's just jump into my back into my slide deck. I'm going to get to the inventory system in a sec here. One of the things I don't like to do in these exercises is spend the entire time sitting in QuickBooks and just moving my mouse around showing you. I don't think, or I, I felt that going through these exercises, and again, your feedback is valued, as, and at the end of this, you're going to have, ask, you have to have a survey about it. I want to not only show you, but I want you to understand. It's the understanding part for me that I think is actually more important than the navigating part. Don't take this the wrong way. People figure it out. QuickBooks is not that hard. But if you think about everything that I've told you so far along the way, when I send you the documentation out, you're going to realize how little of what we talked about is actually in there because it's more about what we do and not how we go about it. And so that's sometimes, I mean, I can show you how to install QuickBooks. I can show you how to set up a customer, how to build a vent, uh, set up a, a, a vendor, how to do it. But it's all the other little things that we talked around, even just so far as today, that actually really impact your business from a financial perspective. And that's the part that's sometimes lost. Yes. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Can we take an break? We certainly can, if you want to. How about at 2.15, we take a five-minute break, if that works for everybody. Great. Now I can get a water break while I do that. I agree with you, especially the, the programs these days are very intuitive. Very, very intuitive. And, 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 and you're not. And, and so one of the things in particular, so for every one transaction that you do within QuickBooks, there's 11 transactions happening in the background, right? Roughly. Why is that important? Because from your perspective, it simply becomes a data entry right? But if you don't understand what's taking place in the background and why it's taking place, you're missing out on a key aspect of how it affects your business. And so that's what I try to convey when we go through this. I mean, we're going to look at sales receipts and how they relate to your business and customer invoices, right? And that's great because it's another methodology to show to receive payments and process it out. But why did we do it? Is there a better way to do it? Can we do it a different way? I want you to understand, not just see and have to do, but understand why we're doing these things, right? As it relates to the business. That's why you'll notice I'll jump back and forth between some of the older material that QuickBooks has provided that speaks to the desktop side, or I'll jump back in and the document we're working off right now is specifically for QuickBooks Online. But when we talked about things like building credit and all these things that relate to QuickBooks, you're not gonna find that unfortunately in a document somewhere. But these are all vital. I mean, you can't grow your business in this manner if you don't utilize these tools at hand. And most people just don't know it. Unless you've owned or run a business before, how would you know about Dun & Bradstreet? How would you know that you can build credit for your business that quickly by getting a secure credit card? You, you just wouldn't, right? But these are all tools that you can utilize, especially when it comes to small businesses. And, and when I mean small business, I mean below 10 employees, or if it's just you. These are all things you can use to grow your business to become successful. Okay. Uh, we've literally just, oops, too quickly, went through this whole uh, exercise, um, basically generating an invoice, receiving a payment, processing the payment out to the bank. I am not even going to spend any time on this because I'm assuming this is as straightforward as it gets from your perspective. One of the things that I really love about QuickBooks, and I will be completely honest with you, is the ability for a customer to be able to pay your invoice on their phone the moment they get it, right? So it goes back to the cash flow, right? So here's the great thing that I've discovered about QuickBooks Online, right? 
if we build an in, a customer and send them an invoice, right, in their email, right, they'll see the email, they'll see the terms, and they'll pay it later. When it pops up directly on their phone, right, and they have the option to click and pay right now, guess what a large percentage of them do? Click and pay right now, okay? Which improves whose cash flow? Okay, and so having that understanding, the convenience of it, and there, there's, a, there's a psychological aspect to, oh, bill, pay, don't have to worry about it. Or bill, I'll put it in the system and I'll pay it in 30 days. There is an aspect of that that is convenient for the customer just to see, click pay and be done. And then guess what they do the next month? Same thing. So now all of a sudden, because of the way that you're invoicing the client, you're finding that the client is playing sooner. Holy moly, getting to pay a bill sooner. As crazy as it sounds, a good percentage of the customers and the businesses that I deal with find this aspect is one of the best parts about QuickBooks for them because they come in the next day and they're like, oh man, they paid already. Wow, great. It's a convenience. It's one less thing to worry about. So don't sell yourself short when it comes to something like being able to invoice the customer directly and having them pay it that quickly as well. I'm going to go through two more slides and then I am actually going to jump on the inventory um, workflow side of things only because we can tend to have quite a few. The sales receipts and the deposits are pretty straightforward. I, I don't know that anybody here doesn't know what a sales receipt and how it relates to deposit. If they don't, let me know. But I'm going to walk through these slides pretty quickly only because I do want to get to the inventory. Let me know if there's any specific questions that come up while I walk through this. When are we going to take a break? 215, we said. 217. Okay. Well, we are going to take a break while I get the inventory system set up then. <laughs> Let's go ahead. Gosh. 17. I apologize for being four minutes late. Okay. Let's take a five minute break and then I'm going to. Right. Great question, guys. I love it. I really do. It doesn't apply to me, but. Um... Mm -hmm. I love this question because I deal with it all the time. Two ways. You, what's that? Yes. So I just had the question posed to me about how we handle credit card transactions in specific because the net that it QuickBooks tends to be less the credit card fee that is being processed. So I deal with this quite a bit, um, whether it's through Stripe or any of these other institutions that manage the credit card side of the world. The good news is there's two distinctive ways to handle this within QuickBooks. The easiest and most convenient way, and I'll use Stripe as an example because they do a wonderful job, is to set up the credit card processor as a vendor. And on a monthly basis, they generate a statement for you showing you exactly how many transactions and how much they charged you. This is by far the quickest, most convenient, and easiest way to do it, because you're only having to do one transaction once a month, and once it's done, it will tie back to the bank. Here's the thing. Most businesses do not like to do it like that. They want to see the credit card transaction actually on the invoice for the entire amount less the fee. In those cases, I created a new line item within the chart of account for credit card processing fees. Each invoice that is then generated and paid upon, when I go in to receive the payment, I enter the fee. So the invoice is thus reduced by that line item amount. Is it an extra step? Yes, it is. Does it make more work? Yes, it does. But it is the most accurate way to track it. So you have two choices. You have the one, which I prefer to do monthly because it ties back just as good. Depending on the business that you're in, you can also do it at the individual invoice level. Does that answer your question? You're welcome. Another question. Oh, I love questions. QuickBooks together with Shopify, or do we have to enter everything manually? No, there is an open API for Shopify. I only know this. Um, from dealing with a couple of other companies, but they actually do have an open, do, do we all know what an open API is, right? 
So yes, Shopify does have an open API that will facilitate bringing the information directly into QuickBooks in the same manner that a credit card or a bank feed would work. So those transactions would post within the feed the next day when you came in, and you would simply have to categorize those codes. Uh, I have a question, what is an API? Aha. So an API at its, at its core is a program that enables communication between two different pieces of software that can be customized to meet your needs. That's as, as simple as I want to put it right now without going down a deep, deep rabbit hole. Integration. And integration. Yeah. And more importantly, the ability to customize a specific integration within the system. Yes. Open it's free. The, the, the word open only means that it's completely free to everyone to use as, a pay, as opposed to paying a subscription or a fee associated with it. Okay. Any more questions? Oh, we're still on our break, aren't we? I think we have about one minute in your break. <laughs> one minute left. That's okay. So if you want to go grab some water, we can um, get back going in uh, about a minute. Yeah. The inventory side of things. Okay. You know, one thing we haven't touched on, and I won't go into it if we don't need to, is third party payroll processing. Um, Paychecks. Paychecks. Yeah, there is direct integration there too. Um, depending on who they are, ADP, Paycheck, blah, blah, blah. If you don't use QuickBooks module, you can certainly use third parties as well. They're extremely robust. They all integrate directly within QuickBooks. There is also a program out there that if you do have additional transactions that are taking place expense-wise, that you can use to import directly into QuickBooks and will do it for you automatically once it's set up. I don't like to go down that rabbit hole unless it's necessary as it relates to your business because there's a little bit more knowledge that's needed to go ahead and get things like that set up. I do put it out there that if there is a need for your company and you have something, do talk to me or we can set up and I can spend some more time going about it. Um, again, it does get a little bit more complicated and I don't want to send you guys down that rabbit hole per se. Carlene asks if QuickBooks links with any other program besides Shopify. Um, I think there's over a thousand different yeah. programs I'll out there. Like yeah, there's a Shopify. It's huh. an online retail platform essentially that um, vendors can kind of set up their own shop, shop. on the site. But Shopify. They're like a host, yeah. almost is the way I would describe it, for other businesses yeah. out there. It, it's kind of like. And it's like Etsy, but for non-creators, so people yeah. can sell, mm -hmm. That's a good sell products mm -hmm. or yeah, anything, anything like that. Okay, inventory. Since it's been brought up more than once, so let me tell you about my inventory story because it's kind of a cool story. So um, when I first moved up here, I actually worked for a winery, and um, a family-owned business had grown for many years and they got to a point where they needed someone to kind of come in and take a look at it financially from a high level perspective and build QuickBooks out for them. They've been working off all these different platforms. And one of the very first questions they asked me is, how can we generate an inventory control system within QuickBooks and integrate it into both the wine tasting rooms and our production rooms? And it got me thinking about inventory and I'd never, I've, I've dealt with inventory within QuickBooks when I was working for REC Solar, so a big solar company builds solar arrays, so many panels, so many arms, so many bolts, it all goes together. Great. Well, wine's a little different, to be honest with you. Okay. And the, it actually highlighted how important the inventory control system was from my side of the world. And I, I'm going to share the story to show you what I mean. So when people think about wine and bottling wine, you know, they think of the grapes coming off and smashing the grapes, and then it just pours into a bottle and it ends up on the shelf, right? But that's not at all what takes place, right? So you have this harvesting of the grapes, you have the grapes getting processed and crushed, right? And so then we bottle the wine. Yeah, but the problem is it's not just the bottle that makes up the wine, right? It's the label, it's the cork, it's the little claspy thing that goes around it. And you have to have all those items to be able to just generate that one bottle. Well, imagine you're at a winery and they're doing five different types of wine. That's times five. So when it comes to bottling, your actual bottling of the wine, you need to know that you've got enough corks, that you've got enough labels. 
And your inventory control system is what manages that for you. What does that mean, Damon, though? Well, it means that when you go to generate things like purchase orders or dealing with your vendors, the system knows how much you ordered, how much you have, and how much you expect to receive. And it knows the dates associated with that. So when we went to go do a bottling, the system would tell me, we have enough to bottle 10,000 bottles. By next Tuesday, we'll have enough to bottle 25,000 bottles. And by next Thursday, we'll have enough to bottle 30,000. So we could plan out what our schedule look like from a bottling perspective. It also let the tasting rooms know when they could expect the wine to be bottled and be delivered there. And conversely speaking, as they started to sell those wines in the tasting room, we reduced the inventory count and let us know which wines were selling better and we need to produce more, which wines were selling less and we need to not produce less of. And so this is how, at a high level, QuickBooks can manage your inventory control system. It has the ability through the purchase order system to control not only what is coming in, but what you have the ability to put together and go out the door, okay? Which is almost as important as knowing what I have to be able to sell per se. Now, can I pose this question? The particular individual that is asking me about this inventory, can they tell me the kind of business they're dealing with? Is it's con um, pound, yeah. pound, pound, five pound, thirty pound, shell and in shell, in addition to purchase pecan oil for sale, nutcracker company. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Now I have a better idea. Excuse me while you do this at the same time. Okay. So I'm guessing basically what you want to have an understanding is what you receive in right? Whether it's nuts, shelled, unshelled, and then basically what you're selling out and what that ratio is. Conversely speaking, having a clear understanding of what you have in inventory as it relates to the different peanuts and peanuts oil. One of the things we, we utilize within the inventory system is we utilize, utilize the purchase order to facilitate ordering things. So does everyone know what a purchase order is? Yeah. Okay. So we send out a purchase order to our vendor, a customer, excuse me, to a vendor to order stuff, and we're ordering 10 pounds of peanuts, 10 pounds of pistachios, and 10 pounds of walnuts, right? And I'm just using this example. And we send our PO out to our vendor, and our vendor comes back and says, first two orders are going to be there next Tuesday. We're out of back-ordered on walnuts. They won't be here until two weeks from Friday. Okay? So automatically now, you know, as you're receiving orders in, what you have in inventory, what you're looking to sell and filling orders why, and when you can expect to receive the balance. So you know how many orders you can fill right now based on the inventory that you have. How do you know what the inventory is, Damon? Ah, when you receive the purchase order and the items are delivered to you, you receive them in QuickBook, right? Which adds to the count in QuickBook. When we go ahead and sell to the customer, we invoice. When we invoice, the system reduces the inventory associated with that specific line item. This all ties back to the lists that we talked about a little earlier on, where we would set each specific item that is an inventory up within the list so that we could track against it. We would also tell them how much we're paying, whether it's by pound as it relates to peanuts, and we would be able to track that, right? Now, the key part about this particular instance is I wouldn't want to understand what is she looking to track. Does she bring in the peanuts unshelled at a certain weight and then deshells them and sells them out and she wants to account for that, those shell weight? Because what is that to the business? Oh, we claim that as an expense. Time and effort associated with deshelling those to come up with a nut, I can claim that as an expense, but I need to be able to document what I received, what I end up selling, what was the delta before. And I'm just throwing this out, in, and so add more context if you want the individual that I'm dealing with this inventory control system. That way we always have a clear understanding. We also have a clear understanding of what our margins look like. And this is a big one when it comes to the lists, right, and ability to track inventory. Because if you know how much you received and you know how much you paid for it per pound, the system is going to generate a cost basis for you based on that. In turn, when you go to generate an invoice for the customer, the system knows what you paid what you sold it out, and it's going to give you your margin. 
So now all of a sudden, not only are you controlling your inventory, what's coming, what's going, where is it at, you understand which particular products are making you more money and which particular products are not making you as much money, which means you can manage how you grow the business. What are you going to buy more of? The stuff you sell. What are you going to buy less of? Stuff you don't sell. All tied back to the inventory control system and how it's managed. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and it is a part of this that people forget when it comes to the inventory that they only perceive the item that they're buying and then reselling. But really, it's a cost basis, you know, because at the end of the day, what the system actually does, and I didn't touch on this when we talked about the wine bottles, but the system actually goes, the cork was a dollar, the label was 50 cents, the bottle was $3, and the wine was $3. My cost basis is $9. You're selling this bottle of wine for 38 bucks. What's your margin? The system's already... You want to the tendency to capture those pennies. And not part of your cost of goods. That is exactly right. And that's why it's so important that, that you are capturing the cost of goods associated with that particular item that you're selling because... Each bottle, in the case of the winery, is slightly different, right? Slightly different expenses associated with it. And so that's the only way that you can really understand what the total cost basis is associated with that particular bottle. The same is going to relate to this individual that we're talking about. She grows them, and we grow them in bulk, bring them in. Okay. Great. For the pecans. For the pecans. Okay, and then you de-shell them? I'm guessing, and weigh them again, and then process them out again. And so that that process of deshowing them is actually there's time and effort associated with it, which means it's an expense to the business. Now, from an inventory perspective, we could set up a category that would receive those walnut walnuts, right? Oh, pecans. Sorry, receive those pecans in as a bulk order. It would know what the cost basis is based on what you paid for it, right? And then. So that, well, ha, ha, that's a great question. I love it. Um, how does it work? So it's the expense associated with what? Growing them. So we keep it completely separate. We track it completely separate from the other, from receiving it in temper because she's going to have expenses associated with soil, bugs, uh, harvesting, all the things that a winery tradition, water maintenance. And these are all expenses associated with the business per se that we, yes. But but the actual capturing of harvesting and receiving those in is what she's talking about specifically now. And how do I track that? And how do I part? So we receive it into inventory. And, and I'm guessing they have harvest season, just like a traditional wine. You would harvest all of these pecans. You would receive them into inventory. Let's say 1,000 pounds of pecans into inventory. She would then turn around and say, well, we're going to sell them as 8-ounce bags, 12-ounce bags. So we already know how many bags we can generate because we have the poundage, right? She in turn is bagging these and then selling them off to, I don't know, a distributor. She's going to the farmer's market, et cetera, et cetera. And as she sells each one of those bags, so she sells 40 bags, the system would reduce the count associated with that, right? It, again, it goes back to what we talked about with the wine bottles, right? It's not just the wine bottles, it's the label on the cork. Well, when you sell nuts, guess what? It's not just the nut. It's the bag it goes into. It's the label on the bag, right? So my question would come back is like, okay, so what's the denomination that you sell those nuts back to the individuals? Is it a bulk sale where they just call you and say, I need 500 pounds of, of pecans, or is it a bag of eight ounces like when you walk into a 7-Eleven? Once I understood that, I could build an inventory system that would have each one of those line items. So if she sold a t an 8-ounce bag and a 12-ounce bag and a 16-ounce bag, we would have those bags listed out within the list. We would have the cost basis associated with it. The system would generate and know what the margin is based on the price that we're selling them to. And it's simply a matter of her going in, clicking on the line item, specifying the quantity, and the system would automatically reduce inventory for that line item. When you receive them, no, there's not. There's not because we track that separately. Mm -hmm. That's what the list is for. Absolutely. The water, yep. Um, fertilizer, yes. All of that, yeah. And I, I would keep them separate. 
I mean, even though they're, they're under the umbrella, I, I would have a line. I always did that even with the wineries. You have the maintenance and the upkeep of servicing the vineyards separate from the harvesting and the production side of things. Because honestly, all of that is an expense to the business per se. Where on the other side of things, we're, tra- we're talking more so associating with the inventory control side, which is specifically about what she's talking about. But yes, you are absolutely correct. She's a farmer at its core. <laughs> I find it I find it fascinating. I I I, I truly do. You know, um, I would love to spend some time with her. You know, um, if we could get her name and see if I could set up a one-on-one session with her. Because again, it's really hard for me to speak. I mean, she's selling nuts again. Is she selling bulk? Is she selling it in an eight-ounce bag? Is she just? If I had a better understanding, then I could build out a better inventory control system for her. Point at hand that I really want to make is that it has a very robust um, order system. Again, from, I'm just going to go through the objectives of this exercise here because we've touched on it. Enable you to set up an inventory control system, which is what we just talked about. Order received using purchase orders. We talked about that, right? Utilizing the purchase order. And the nice part about that is purchase orders directly integrate within, to, within QuickBooks. So as the vendor acknowledges that they've they're sending you 20 crates of whatever, the system knows it as well. Conversely, when it shows up on your door, you're receiving it into inventory. It's a real-time count, right? The ability to adjust inventory, right? You always do a month-end tie-out to your inventory, or you should be. Guess what ends up happening, guys? A bottle got broken. A bottle went missing. I don't quite have this. The ability to adjust that and account for that is great within QuickBooks, and it's super, super easy. I mean, don't take it so long. I worked for a winery. What, what happened at the end of each month? I mean, come on now. There was a couple of balls missing, okay? Invariably, it happened. You know, somebody dropped it. Somebody walked off with one, and something got lost. And it's only those three scenarios that it played out. But you have to be at a for it. There's still an expense and a loss to the business that needs to be, create, that needs to be documented and tracked, right? Lastly, and most importantly, you can generate fantastic inventory reporting. So when you do your monthly reporting, if you report to someone else or you have to generate reports, QuickBooks does an amazing job of showing you what's on hand, what's forecasted to be received, and what the expectation is moving forward. So if you have additional orders out further out than 90 days, the system can account for that. Again, it all goes into the process of setting it up correctly. Oh, am I, did it, am I, you seen the screen? The reasons to track inventory? Ah, no, good point. I, I'm doing multiple slides, that's why. Love the interaction, guys. It helps me when I get feedback from you guys as to what I'm doing. So, I'm current slide, okay. Okay, um, again, I actually, this is the, uh, the slide I was just talking through. Um, apologies for not having it up on the screen. But again, uh, in, enable inventory control using the purchase order system. The sell inventory, which is when you invoice a customer, it automatically reduces the line item. The ability to manually adjust the inventory. And most importantly, at the end of the day, generate an inventory report associated with currently what you have on hand. The reasons to track inventory. When you use purchase orders to buy inventory items, QuickBooks updates your inventory so you know which items are on order and when they are due to be received. Again, from a forecasting perspective, fulfilling orders for your customer, relating to the peanut lady in particular, you know, she, her purchase order is outstanding. She knows exactly when she's expected to receive it, and she also knows when she's supposed to fill the orders for her customers. Um, in this case, she's the one actually growing it, so the latter part is not as applicable. But for businesses that are on hand, meaning they need to receive something to be able to process it and sell it out, this is a great system, right? A winery being a great example, because it's not just the wine. I, I, I can, if I only have, you know, 800 bottles, guess how many bottles of wine I'm making? 800. I got an order for 1,000, I gotta go find 200 bottles. They ain't gonna show up until next week. But at least I can turn around and say to my customer, look, I can't fill you a thousand order bottle, but I'll have 800 by next week, and the week after I'll have the other 200. No problem. Thanks, Damon. You have a happy customer. As opposed to, oh, I'll get you your thousand bottles. You know what? I'm really sorry. I only have 800. 
Really? This is ridiculous. I counted on those thousands. This is how inventory control can help you help your customer. Um, you can easily keep track of the cost to you of the items you have sold, exactly to the point we just spoke about, the cost of goods sold. This is vitally important, guys. I can't tell you how many times I sit down with a business and they go, I'm making this. And I go, okay, how much does it cost you to make it? You don't know how much it's costing you. For your business perspective, how can you calculate out the margin and what you should be making on it? It is vitally important that you understand what it costs you to operate your business. And when it comes to either service or products, understand what the product is costing you and understand what the service is costing you. Right? If you don't, then you're selling yourself short because it probably means you're not marking it up enough. And that's a true statement. Because when we start a business, what do we always want to do? We want to be cheap. We want to compete with everybody else. And to, be, to compete with everyone else, we perceive that we need to be what? See? Guess why everyone goes to Starbucks and spends $7 on a cup of coffee when they could walk across the street and get the same cup of coffee for a dollar? Why do people do it? Does anyone know the answer? Um, so, well, I, I get the dollar copy too. But the answer to the question is they get exactly what they want. So they'll stand in the line for 10 minutes. They'll pay $7 for a cup of coffee. But when they get to the front of that line, they get to say to the barista, I want a double swirl, triple shot, flipped over backwards with all the stuff on top. And the lady behind the counter goes, okay, $8. And you go, awesome, here's eight bucks. You know why? Because you got exactly what you wanted out of it, right? Your customer's the same. If you can fulfill that need for them, they'll pay it. They'll pay a premium for it, for the service, for the quality of the product, for what you deliver. The point I'm trying to make here, and I'm getting a little car, don't ever sell yourself on price. Sell yourself on your product, the service, and the quality of which you deliver it, not the price. Because what happens when you, when you dictate it on price? It becomes all about price. How do you grow? How can you increase your pricing? If you're so focused on always being that low cost, it's really hard to grow your business from that perspective. Focus on the other side, the quality of service that separates you from the competition, the quality of customer delivery service, the customer of the product that you, the quality of the product that you deliver. Focus on those things. Those things will grow businesses. Those things will increase revenue line. Not being the cheapest. And I'm not saying don't be cheap, right? I'm just saying be smart in the way that you go about it. Okay. Inventory. Since I promised we would get through this, you can easily keep track of the income you receive from sales of inventory items. I particularly like this when it comes to the reporting side. Um, as I stated earlier, inventory is a great way to understand the trends of your business. What's selling? Is it seasonal? Right? What is more profitable? What am I selling more of and generates me more revenue? All of these can be generated and, and articulated through the inventory control system, right? So if you have a clear understanding that you're noticing when it comes to your product or service that it's seasonal based, you can plan and budget for it accordingly. If you know that your summers are super busy and that you need to account for a higher inventory account over summer, this is where you're gonna to start to see some of those trends associated. And this is how you're able to grow your company based on this information. All of it is relevant to growing your business and moving it forward. You can always know your current quantities on hand. This is a big one, right? This really is a big one. Um, before I started at the winery, they would do an inventory count every Friday and they would always be off 5%, always. And they could never figure it out, never. Oh yeah, it took three hours to do that. You can well imagine. So think about this now. We're spending three hours every week just counting bottles and even that is off by 5%. So I'm not even getting the full capture. And that's why they quickly realized that they needed some form of an inventory control system to be able to help them manage what was taking place at the winery. And we had this big disassociation between the winery and the tasting room and what was making. And it was only by utilizing the inventory control system that we find out that people were actually stealing boxes of wine. So we discovered that, you know, we were shipping out, you know, 800 cases of wine and then 790 were making it to the winery when we received into inventory and I'm going I just my system's telling me you had 800 cases of wine 
that left the winery and I only got 790 showing up at the tasting room. Where's the other 10 cases? Well, maybe they fell off the back of the truck three months in a row. I mean, like, but you would never know, right? Because I got caught by somebody, but then we started to realize, well, that 5% each month wasn't a miscount. It was walking off the premises. How would you have known? Do the math, guys. I mean, if we're talking 5% of 1,000 bottles every week, not pocket change, you know? A case of wine is 140 bucks, right? So $1,000 each week, 4,000 a month, 48,000 a year, it adds up. If they had an inventory control system, they would have caught that way sooner, okay? Again, you are your own master. You have to be the expert when it comes to all of this as it relates to your business, even the inventory control side. You always know the current value of inventory. This one is important. Um, the reason this one is important, especially if you're dealing with items that fluctuate in price. I talked about the candles as a great example. Candles and the oils associated fluctuate in price. So, you know, she bought 50 pounds of candle wax. She's got her incense. She pours it. She mixes it. This week it cost her $4 to make it. When she went back to buy that, that wax again, it's gone up 8%, right? She needs to be out of account for that. Every, are you kidding me? The last two years, I mean, it's just, it's been terrible for everybody from a cost of living standpoint. But how is she going to know that? She would need to have an understanding of what her inventory, what her cost basis was from a cost of goods perspective, and how does that reflect? And so, again, all of this comes together because it ties back to your margin. And how much profit am I making off each item? As the costs go up, my margins go down. That's why if you're always going to compete on price, you're always putting yourself at a losing position, right? It's, it's just natural to go there because it's the easier path, but it is a mistake that most small businesses make. The other one, right, is they underprice themselves. To be really honest with you guys, most businesses start up within the first year that are selling a product or a service tend to underprice themselves. They did. For a couple of reasons. One, it's become competitive. Number two, from a competitive standpoint, they perceive that they can become more competitive with the other businesses around them by beating them on price. But if price is your only point to stand on, you're not going to win because the person that's going to beat you is quality of service delivered. It always will because over time it adds up. Right, you can't stay cheap and deliver the level of service that you may want to with that with that philosophy at hand. At least that's my experience in dealing with it. So I am not one who believes in always looking at the lowest price. I prefer to look at the quality of the service or the product being delivered. And don't undersell customer service. Do not, because customer service will keep people coming back. Right, they may not have enjoyed the experience of buying something for you. But the experience of going through your customer service will either lose you that customer or keep you one for life based on that experience. And it's just a true statement when it comes to sales in general. Okay, let's just talk about quickly how QuickBooks oops, handles the inventory system. Um, I'm pretty sure everyone is familiar with FIFO, first in, first out. As a costing method, QuickBook Online will always consider the first unit purchased. So again, this touches back to receiving items into inventory, the so first in, to be the first unit sold for the first unit out, and will adjust your assets and the cost of goods sold, more commonly known as COGS, uh, accordingly whenever the sales inventories are entered. This means that it's a real-time system. As you receive it in, it updates the inventory. As you sell it out and invoice the customer, it reduces the inventory. As long as you stay on top of it, you, you true up at the end of each month on the last day of the month, just like you should be, you will never run into an issue with the inventory control system. The area that you run into issues that I tend to find or have experienced in the past is when you receive inventory in. I don't tend to find that you have an issue with the inventory when you reduce the inventory. I, you bill a customer with an invoice and the system reduces, but the receiving of inventory is key. Because remember, when you receive it in, depending on what it is, it's not already put together. It's just the bottle, just the label, it's just the cork. 
And the only way I can make 2,500 bottles of wine is if I have 2,500 cork, 2,500 bottles, and 2,500 labels. So if I have 25 labels and 25 bottles, but not 2,500 corks. So again, the inventory side of things and knowing exactly where things are, FIFO, first in, first out, may not be always be applicable, but that is the system that it utilizes. Again, you do have the ability to go in and modify that, should you choose to. Um, I'm not going to go over this. The, the, I am going to go over the setting up of the inventory because one of the things you can do within here, and this might relate to the peanut lady, is establish SKUs with your inventory control system. So QuickBooks requires several important pieces of information when setting up the information. So the product name is required, category, and the SKU. Do understand that this does directly tie back to the chart of accounts and the list that we've established in the past from an item perspective. These directly correlate back. As it relates to the SKU, my recommendations in this particular instance is if you are ordering something from someone else to put something together, a product together, always use their SKU. Okay. When it comes to the reordering and receiving into inventory, if you're utilizing the SKU that your vendor that you're ordering from and receiving from, it'll make the system a lot easier to track that information. Now, you put the product together and you create a product out of that, that has its own SKU, separate from this SKU here. It just means when it's time to reorder, it makes it that much quicker and that much easier. Also remember, you're generating a purchase order that you're sending to the vendor to fill. If it has his SKUs on there, it's gonna be turned around quicker, less mistakes and less issues for you. Small little things. Um, the initial quantity on hand, Right? So if you have an existing inventory and you're looking to build this out, you can start with an existing inventory on hand. All you need to do is know the count associated with what that inventory is. So what is it? And let's generate an inventory line item associated with it. Pretty straightforward. Reorder point. QuickBooks reminds you when you pass a certain point in stock to order more. I really, really like this. You can set up alerts for any line item you want whether it drops below a certain percentage. So as soon as it dropped below 30% for us, when it related to either bottles, labels, or corks, because there's a lead time, the system would then let us know and we would process that order up, right? You can set these reminders up and these reorder points on any item you want within the system. And the system will track it as a percentage or as a specific amount, choice is yours, and then remind you to reorder. Not only will it remind you to reorder, it will remind you of what vendor you dealt with and what was the last order you placed. Some nice features that are available within QuickBooks. Inventory asset account. QuickBooks choose if you don't. So this is where you can, and I don't want to go too far down this avenue, but you can set up different lines if you want. So an example would be um, the peanut growing lady the two sides of the world from an inventory side. So she has the growing side of the world and a cost associated with that. She has the harvesting and the so a cost associated with that. And then she has the packaging, the, mer the merchandising, and then the distribution side of things. Well, three separate categories altogether. Um, the reason they're separate is traditionally, um, most farmers out there, not all, tend to bring in labor to harvest, which is subcontracted out, which is separate from the production and manufacturing side of things. So as traditionally a winery will bring in a crew that their sole job is to harvest. They don't work for the winery. They come in for six weeks, they do the complete harvesting and then they move on to the next winery, right? And mostly those tend to be independent contractors that you deal with in those businesses. Uh, let's see. So a couple of key points as it relates to setting up the inventory is entering the description and the sales price, right? This enables the system to generate the margins associated with that particular product for you to show you exactly what the margins are on that particular product. It is vitally important that you set up each line item. So each different type of bottle of wine or each different type of nut that she's selling out there, we would set up with that price point. Can you do the opposite? Can you set up a margin? Yes. So it'll determine the price? Mm -hmm. You absolutely can. And you can actually set up multiples, right? So if you kind of have what you know that you want to do a 10% premium or a 30% premium on what you're selling out there, you can specify different margin amounts in there as well. 
Choose the income account. This will be the income account that tracks the sales again. Pretty straightforward, nothing too complicated here. This is, what's it? Oh, I repeat. She, well, she sees the chat behind you. Uh, yeah, and the other question? Ah. So, sure. So the the question was, could you do an opposite scenario where you told the system calculate out what the margin would be at a specific percentage point, right? Is no, what you? A certain percentage point. Yes, you could. So if you if you you told the system to just automatically mark things up twenty percent. The system would automatically do that. Conversely speaking, you could say to the system at a certain price point, mark it up X amount. You can even have a schedule in there. The system has the ability to receive a schedule that you can work off in there as well. And it's simple as an Excel spreadsheet can be set up to do something like that as well. Again, it, it, I know, and I only know this because my brother is married to someone who harvests walnuts up into Larry. But the, 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 the nut market can fluctuate huge in price differential year over year and this impacts their ability to grow service and sell nuts in particular um, I, I know that the walnut industry has just been decimated over the last two years and so um, in regards to what she's talking about specifically yes you you do have the ability to do it both ways and you can set them up both ways and choose which one you want to utilize the system will do all the calculations for you um, Moving on, choose the sales tax if required. So we, we haven't touched too much on taxes yet, but um, QuickBooks does have the ability to go ahead and generate taxes, sales tax associated with in California. There's three aspects to it that it looks at. It looks at the state, looks at the county, and looks at the city, right? So those are your three primary components that make up the tax rate that you are charged. What it actually does, so that we understand, is it looks at your address and your zip code. It looks at the address and the zip code of the person that you're sending it to. It actually physically pulls those zip codes. And as a reference point, the IRS uses the post office as the point of reference when it comes to addresses and zip codes from a zoning perspective. So what do I mean by that, Dan? I'm getting real complicated here. That is correct. So what dictates the actual tax rate is where the product is physically being shipped to. That's why when you set it up within the system, we talked about the importance of setting up vendors and customers correctly. It's because it's based on that zip code, right? It looks at the nexus and it establishes that zip code and what that associated tax rate is. So here in San Luis County, we're at eight and a half percent. So that's a combination of five and a half percent for the state. 2.5% uh, for the county, and then 1.5% for the city. That's how your tax rate is made up as a whole, per se. So the system is able to go in, pull the relevant zip code, get you the, the tax rate. And the nice thing about it is if it's set up correctly, it'll do it state by state. So when I was at REC, I did all the tax filings for all the states, including Hawaii, which has use tax, which is a freaking nightmare because it's double taxation. But you're able to do it super easy because it just does the accrual for you at the end of the each month you just log into the boe it'll break it out by city county and state and you're required to break it out when you do at least california one right and it's right there in front of you so from your perspective if it's set up correctly you do need to set the counties up right once the counties are set up within the system the system knows and breaks it down but it does make it a lot lot easier there are also third party um companies out there like Avatax that will actually do it for you automatically and you just pay a small fee at the end of each month. Bring it on. One, if you're not, if you have no nexus in those other states, mm -hmm. you would have to collect bills. You would not. Do you have the option to enter their retail number or identify their you, yeah. Sure. So um, the first one is if you don't have a nexus within the state, then you wouldn't have to co collect taxes. Basically, it was your first statement. And that, that is a true statement. The second part was that you can have a, what's known as a resale certificate on hand. 
Um, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with what a resale certificate is, so let me explain it really quick, quickly what it is and what it's utilized for. So we used to use them extensively when I was at REC Solar, right? Why? When you're putting a product together that you're then going to resell to someone else, right? You're charged taxes on all the components that you utilize to put that product together. But when you sell that product to the end customer, they're taxed as well. A way to bypass having to incur that tax as the intermediary is to gain what's known as a resale certificate from the vendor that is selling you the item. Basically what we're stating is that we're passing that along, that sales tax, right? The way we're able to do that is by having a resale certificate on file. We carry the resale certificate. It's good for one year. It needs to be completed annually. And the vendor is, holds on to the resale certificate. When we do the final invoice to the customer, they're the one that hold the liability associated with that. So when I was ordering the panels from China associated with installing at the Costco in Santa Maria, there was zero taxes on that for me at all, right? And the reason for that is that that tax was actually gonna be passed along to the end customer. Now, it gets a little bit more complicated as we talk taxes here, but do imagine that most of this is taking place in the continental United States and that we're dealing with businesses here in the US. It gets a little bit more complicated with the scenario I gave you because we're dealing with international companies. So, but understand basically what you're doing is you're absolving your business of having to pay that sales tax at that point in time. Usually advantageous to anyone that's putting a product together, something that's tangible, that's made up with multiple components that ends up with an end consumer. On the opposite side, it's more like the pecan lady mm -hmm. she said she sells some individual packet, but she also sells in bulk. So maybe yeah. the person she's selling in bulk to is, is actually the reseller. That, that is correct. <clears throat> yes, she would. Correct. And, and in her case, you, you would be looking at two different avenues there. The bulk sale would be kept separate from the commercial packet side of things, but you're 100% right. If that entity that is buying the bulk is then taking that bulk and rebagging it and then reselling it to the customer, 100% correct. You would have a resale certificate on hand to facilitate that. Now, I don't know what additional costs she would be incurring, but you, that would be a scenario where you would be able to utilize a resale certificate per se. Like your, you can sell for this thing, but how it works is, are you buying all of the things that go into packaging those mm -hmm. and paying sales tax on them? Bills, the bag. And then, I guess it comes out with the product. It, it, Correct, and because of the expense side of things associated with the packaging and whatever. It's just, it's really, are you an intermediary to the end customer? Or are you the one that's facilitating the transaction to the end customer? And, and in her case, she actually would be both because she's got the bulk side sale of it, and then she's got the small packs as well. That's why I actually want to spend some time and get a little bit more info, and I love doing this stuff. It's right up my alley. Okay, enter the expense or account required for QuickBooks to choose the cost of goods sold if you don't edit it. So again, tracking both sides of this operation from both the tracking of the cost of goods coming in and then the, the expense account side of things within QuickBooks is vitally important. As it relates to the inventory side of things, this also ties back to when things like accidents happen. We, something gets destroyed, something gets damaged, something gets returned right? All of those we can claim. Now, if we get a product back from something that we ship to a customer that's damaged or destroyed, we get to claim the cost, the COGS associated with that. We don't get to claim the total cost that we sold it to the customer. And again, that's where this would start come into play. And it does invariably happen. I mean, returns are part of, of dealing with any business when it comes to a product. So having the ability to receive items back in and being able to write those off, this is exactly what it's speaking to here. Enter purchase tax. I, I'm not going to touch tax today because, yeah, I know you were. And I, 
I, I just because it goes down such a rabbit hole and it relates so specifically to each business that I'm talking about, whether it's her bulk sale or individual packet. I don't even know what you guys do. So again, I am more than willing to talk taxes separately, one on one, or when I do my advanced class. But it just, yeah, it's too much of a rabbit hole for us to go down. Again, if you have specific questions, I'm always willing to answer them. I'm not going to go through the examples in here of adding SKUs, price points. We've talked about it. Adding to the system is pretty easy. These are just showing you examples of what a, a particular inventory item could look like. So you've got headphones, you've got the SKU, which you ordered it from the vendor. You've got the sales price. Um, you've got the cost associated with the specific line item and the system then it can track the inventory and the margins associated with it. That's an acronym probably. That's just, the I think it might be a, a, the acronym for the headphones. H. Which is sales, sales tax. tax. Yeah, isn't that a Canadian designation? It might just be examples. Yeah, I, I believe it is a Canadian designation. Um, using exam Canadians as examples. Jeez. <laughs> uh, key features. So I, again, we, we we touched on the inventory control system. We touched on how it can be utilized. We touched on the cost of goods. We touched on margins. We touched on cogs. Now the system is circling back and basically talking about how the purchase order system that we talked about briefly, I normally do the purchase order first and then the inventory, the system likes to do it in reverse, um, which is fine. Uh, feature in QuickBooks Online Plus used to order inventory parts and manage receipt of the products and back order. So this, this is what I was talking about with the bottles and the labels. Do keep this in mind. Um, when you activate the inventory control system within QuickBooks, you do need to upgrade to the QuickBooks Plus, which does cost a little bit more. It's the same as the payroll. It's just another module that you pay X amount of dollars each month. The last time I looked, I think it was $20 for um, the inventory module and $29 for payroll a month, um, just to give you an example. And that's the last time. Completely free. And I do love the budget system within QuickBooks. It's a great budget system. You can run budget to actuals, monthly budget, um, year to date. Um, I'm a big budget guy in QuickBooks, and I love it. I will tell you. In fact, um, next Tuesday, we have eight new teams coming from Cal Poly entering our accelerator program. We give them each $10,000, and we give them three months to see if they're a viable business, and then they have the ability to win up to 100000 one of the things I require them to do before I give them the money is they have to have a chart of accounts and they have to have a budget. And they have to present it to me. And then I'll write them a check. But, uh, hey, how, it, it, you know what a budget is? It's a roadmap to success. You know what you don't have, you know what you're not going to get anywhere with a roadmap. You have a destination in hand, you need a map, right? Same thing with a business, right? A business plan and a budget are the two documents that are going to be the roadmap to success. And I'm not talking a business plan that we write and we put in a drawer and we never look at. I'm talking about a plan that tells us what we got to do, when we got to do it, and how we have to achieve it, right? And you align that with a budget and you're halfway to having a successful company, right? Because that's the foundation for success right there, right? And staying on top of it. And budget to actuals, nothing will throw a business off sooner than not understanding your budget and having it expense by June. And trust me, it's happened all the time. Unfortunately, because people don't take account of where they're at financially. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, used to order inventory parts and manage the receipts of products and back orders. So basically what we talked about earlier, the system will prompt you, remind you if you need to order something additional to fill an order. Conversely, if something drops below a certain threshold, it will also remind you. POs and non-posting transactions. So obviously a purchase order is something that's generated and sent out. The way we receive it in is when we receive the product, we receive it into inventory. Non-posting transactions are similar, right? Non-posting transactions means that it either wasn't purchased through the purchase order system, we picked up the phone and we said, we need 40 boxes, can you send me 40 boxes? They show up at the door, I've got nothing in QuickBooks that said I ordered 40 boxes, but I gotta receive it in with your AP mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. 
in this case, it would actually be dictated by the invoice. Because uh, th this, this entity that I'm dealing with doesn't have a purchase order system, right? So literally to order from them, I'm calling a mom and pop and going, hey, I need 40 boxes. Can you have them delivered tomorrow afternoon? Well, when that comes in, my, my receiving guy is going to go, oh, let me look at the purchase. Oh, there's no purchase order. Well, let me look at, there's nothing. Then he's going to call the accounting department and go, I got 40 boxes. Oh, yeah, yeah. We ordered those from Smith & Berry yesterday. Please receive them in against Smith & Berry. Received in against Smith & Berry, then your, your receiving guy runs up to the AP department or your accountant hands them the invoice. So now you've received it into inventory, and here's the invoice going into the system. Right? It happens. There's plenty of mom and pops out there that don't have purchase order systems that do just do. True. I, that's not ideal when that happens, but yeah, and in fact, that normally is the case because normally it's the guy at the dock and he has a little iPad and he's receiving it in. But by default, they always look for a purchase order first to tie it back against. But when there's no purchase order, they still have to be received in. And in those cases, they'll normally reach out to the accounting department and go, hey, did somebody put an, this order in? Because they don't want to receive something that hasn't been ordered. That's the other side. The moment you receive something in, it's your onus. You're liable for it. Now, some people will let you return it. There, there's that whole side. But that's normally the general interaction. This is a very, very small percentage piece. I mean, and it gets smaller every day, to be honest with you, because it just everyone these days has some form of automation out there and everybody has a credit card processing or some form of a purchase order system that can be utilized even if it's just an excel document that's generated and they still do that as well um receiving against purchase orders on any purchase transaction so we've actually already talked about this you generate the po the, the items are received in against the PO, reduces the po down until that po is closed out once the po is closed out we go ahead and we pay the bill associated with it. Um, I'm not going to go through the examples again. Again, you're all going to be getting this document. So you'll, this fun reading that I'm skipping over will be available to all of you. And if you have any questions, my email address is available. You're more than welcome to set up a call. Um, I'm going to touch on QuickBooks reports real quick because it actually does tie back to inventory and a lot of what we talked about. So let me just Back one slide, and then I'm going to close out and do opening and do any questions you have. So, QuickBooks reporting. We touched on this at the beginning. QuickBooks Online does a good job with reporting. It is not desktop. You cannot customize it to the level that you can on the desktop side. With that said, it's an incredibly robust reporting. It can be dropped into Excel, PDF, pretty much any format that you want. You can do cash flow reporting, inventory reporting. The nice part, the part that I like the, the best about this is this has actually been around the reporting side for about 20 years. Here's the cool part. Every single report that anyone has ever generated in QuickBooks is available to you. So every template, every version is available to you. It just pulls your data in. So here's what happens. Somebody's generated that report. I don't care what report you are looking for, guess what? A hundred people have already generated it in every version of it you can imagine. So if you want a profit and loss, type in profit and loss, you're going to get a hundred different versions of a profit and loss. Pick the one you like that tells your story. Make it your favorite, just like you have your favorites and your Internet Explorer and Google Chrome and all the rest of it. And when you go to run it next month for your CFO or your CEO, it's there. You don't have to do anything. And so now you can just tweak the report. Well, I want it to show 12 months, not 10. I want it to have all these line items. And I do spend time going into the customizing of the report in the advanced one because I use it for my tax reporting. But the point I'm trying to make is super, super user-friendly. Super user-friendly. Just go in and start playing is what I tell people to do from a reporting perspective. There is nothing in there that somebody else has not already generated for you when it comes to that. Use it, play with it, build. Sure. You specify a date. You, once you generate the report, you can tell the report to run on a certain date at a certain time and email itself to you. You can tell the report to run on a certain date, certain time, and email itself to you and your boss. You can tell it to email you and your subordinates so they can start working on that report to you and get it to you. There are a number of different ways to automate it from a reporting perspective. So like mine, you're talking about the AR and the AP. Remember we were talking about the first thing I did every Monday morning. 
I had that report generated. It ran at six o'clock on, on Monday morning. So when I got in at seven, it was in my inbox waiting for me. 8.30, I had it on the CFO's desk and we were talking about it. Done. I didn't have to think about it, didn't have to worry about it. And that goes for any reporting, any reporting out there, right? And so that, that was my process just to get it set up. I had two specific reports that I ran every week that reports would automatically run the email. First thing I got in the office Monday morning, there's those two emails waiting for me and I knew what to jump on. So again, spending some time customizing it to meet your needs, very, very robust. I'm gonna pause there because there's one other thing that I do wanna to touch on before I open it to questions. Um, so QuickBooks Online has a discussion portal, okay? I love the discussion portal. I will share the link for you. It is a knowledge database. So here's the deal. QuickBooks is always changing things, okay? It, they, they just are, they're always got, I try to constantly stay up to date, but honestly, it's like trying to stay up to date with the IRS. It's sheer impossibility. They're just always doing something. So guess what? I always have questions, I do. I, I'm, I'm much like what I'm teaching you guys. I need to understand it before I can teach it to you guys. I, I might come across something and go, I need to understand this inventory control system. Now, we work for an educational state entity and we have a direct link. I mean, I work with Intuit directly. They provide me with a license that enables me to teach this class and have QuickBooks on my system provide it to our students. So I literally can pick up the phone and call into it and go, hey, you know what? I got this question, but you know what I don't do? I don't call into it. I go to that board. Do you know why? The same answer I gave you with the reports is the answer I'm going to give you now. There is not a question that you can pose that someone hasn't asked a hundred times before. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's an invoice, if it's taxes, if what it is. Because as soon as you type in your question, you're going to get a list of 100 people who ask the same question, and every single one of them is answered by an Intuit expert. It's not Joe Smo, and it's, yeah, it's labeled. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm Intuit certified, so it means I have to go through a certain level of training each year to maintain my level. These are experts at an even higher level than I am at. And so the good news is, is those are the individuals answering these questions. And not only are they answering, they will interact with you, right? It's like a chat bot. They'll come up, they'll answer a question, they'll come back and say, did I answer it? Do you want follow-up? Point I'm trying to make, if you have a question, just go there first. Intuit knowledge base, amazing. There's not a question. Nothing, no, no, and I love it. L listen, when I run into a problem, I get to call tech support and it cost me a dime, okay? I'm, I've never had to, not once. I've never had a scenario that I couldn't either figure out the, the answer or get the answer by using the knowledge portal, to be quite honest with you. Fantastic resource. And if it doesn't give you the answer, you have this guy named Damon that works for the SBDC who you can shoot an email or give a call. So that's the God's honest truth. Um, thank you for attending my class today. I would greatly appreciate that you post any feedback. There will be a survey that will go out. Um, please give me feedback. I can, I really enjoy doing these classes. I'm a little, I don't follow the traditional path in teaching these classes and just going through slides and saying, here's your, here's your. I like to be interactive and have like, and I'm sorry I keep calling you the peanut lady, but I don't know what else to call you. But I, and I love the interaction so that I'm speaking to your needs. If you want to sit down and set up a meeting with me after today, I will be. <laughs> Carlene, she's said an all caps pecan. Sorry, pecan lady, no peanut lady. My bad. Um, if you want to sit up a one-on-one, -on -one, I, I would love to. I will send out an email with all of the slides that I went through today, plus the, the guide. Um, I will make sure to keep the pecan lady on there. Um, and again, just give me feedback, what you like, what you'd like to see more of so that I can improve these. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very different kind of, interaction depending on the size of the class and the people that I have here. I can have people that don't even know what QuickBooks is at times, and then I can have people that are experts at QuickBooks, and I'm trying to kind of wade through the path of both sides. So your feedback is greatly appreciated. A friendly reminder, I do do an advanced class for taxes, and then we do repeat the beginner's class as well in a few months. Madison um, has the details in regards to that, 
Um, at this point in time, I'd like to just open it up to general questions or any questions that you may have relating to what we went over today. Did you guys find it valuable? Did you get what you wanted out of it? And I'm posting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. She, she is, she's tracking those there. Absolutely. So I have a company doing my bookkeeping. Okay. Sure. With that, so I'm wanting to learn QuickBooks so I can just my own stuff. I had my bookkeeper send me a backup mm -hmm. to my system. Mm -hmm. Can I download it or upload it into QuickBooks? Absolutely. I've got my chart account. That is correct. That's That's possible. Possible. That is completely possible. Okay, great. As long as you both are running the same version of QuickBooks. So my fear here is being that she might be running desktop, which means you would need to install desktop to facilitate installing that backup. You would need to clarify, is she running QuickBooks desktop, QBD, or QBO, QuickBooks Online? Um, and me asked, my bookkeeper uses QuickBooks for tracking all my data. However, we are not connected. I would love to get help set up QuickBooks Online and to connect with her. Yes, we can do that. What we would need to do is if you're not connected, she would need a similar scenario um, to back up the existing data. We would then establish a QuickBooks online profile and we would restore that data, which would include everything in there back to that QuickBooks. And we could probably get that completed in an hour session or maybe if you want to. Looks like Mimi is already a client, so. Perfect. We will be introing you to everyone. Perfect. So two answers. So I'm going to give you <clears throat> the answer you're going to want to hear and then the correct answer. So the answer you're going to want to hear is yes, they just add you as an additional user. Um, once you're an additional user, they give you the admin right, and you can just log in and pull the data. Now, my side of the world and, and the true side of your world is that QuickBooks has the ability to generate a tax consultant's copy of QuickBooks, and it's specifically designed to have the relevant information that you are looking for. They're not asking me tax. They're not. Okay. They're asking me as an entry. They're, they're Mm -hmm. posting and all that is, is gotcha. And then, then I would have them set you up as a user, as an admin user, so that you have direct access to everything you want. Right. They need to add. No. Uh-uh. They so all they'll do is they'll go into QuickBooks Online on their side. They'll add you as a user. You'll get an email giving you the link to signing into QuickBooks Online for their company file. It'll prompt you for a password, and you'll be able to log in just as a user. Uh, so when they create the user profile for you, one of the things that's required is an email address associated with the user. Once they establish that, that email address will have an email sent to you for you to create your own password. Yes. Log in. Yes. To give you. Yeah. And and that's really really important because. I want to be able to know what I did versus Bingo. And it's vitally important when it comes to your side because you you want to know exactly what you're doing in relation to everyone else, and you need to have a completely separate user ID set up within QuickBooks for that to happen. I don't know QuickBooks. Not much has changed. It really hasn't. <laughs> it's still still the same. Okay. Mm-hmm. I've worked with these words before too. So no, yeah, that's that's the way. And, and again, they're going to do accounts and copies. There's different versions, but you do want to set it up because you want to be able to track your entries versus everyone else. Because a lot of businesses do use the multi-user side of thing, meaning they create one ID and then they let multiple people utilize it, and that is very dangerous. 
just so you know. You that you really are setting yourself up for headaches like I got the impression that they didn't have a budget because they had the paperwork. Yeah. Um, <laughs> validated that? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Keep them coming. Love the questions. Any more? Desktop? Desktop. Okay. I can help you still. Oh, you can? Yeah. So you won't be able to do it, but I can provide you with the tool. So let's say let's say your accountant is using desktop. It is actually pretty easy to migrate the QuickBooks desktop file to QuickBooks Online. Okay. But it is very, very hard to do the reverse, which I explained earlier. So what we would do is you come back to me, you go, you know what, Damon, she's actually utilizing QuickBooks desktop. I would provide you with a link. It, the file she provides you, we can convert over from a QBD, QuickBooks Desktop, to a QBO, QuickBooks Online. So all you want to bring over is your start of account, and that's yeah. you're starting a new business. Well, no, they've been, they've been monitoring it since the first week. So he has all that history. all the history, and I'm thinking, I may just do a uh, you know, a science system, mm -hmm. along with their, just, just compare, yeah. Just so that I can learn it. Absolutely. That's smart. I think uh, that's a really good idea. So I can, I'm so a, I'm just trying to get ahead of that. I love it. Because I'm taking $600 a month. Oh, geez. Which is crazy. That's crazy. And, and I don't have, I don't need all that. Wow. And yeah, I no. That's, 150 of that is payroll. I'm the only employee. Oh, that's ridiculous. So then I'm thinking, okay, oh, my goodness. A pop. Yeah. yeah. There's no, none of that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that, I, absolutely. I mean, I'm a huge advocate of learn by doing. Yeah. And the, the best way to learn QuickBooks is to get in there and start asking the questions and be involved. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah if, I run, if I run a all this in the first three months. Let's right. do that. Yes, yeah, we can do that. So, um, Carlene's question. Mm -hmm. My daughter posts um, charges on the fly with her program, like she is charging example gas, takes pictures of invoices. And the invoice filed away. Does QuickBooks do something? So QuickBooks does something similar to that that enables you to do something along those lines where you can document the expense right away. You are able to have QuickBooks on your phone physically. Um, so yes, Carlene, you, you do have the ability to do something along those lines. Um, there are a number of third-party products out there that integrate with QuickBooks that add on to that, but it does have the ability to do what you're talking about. Hopefully that answers your question. So I want to run my business. I want to be able to, to manage my business, mm -hmm. my personal, mm -hmm. and my, uh, I have rentals. Okay. So I can do it all on one QuickBooks online no. account if I classify, if I create classes. Wow. Okay. So you are a little further alone than you think if you're bringing up class coding so to me. I to about so, yes. Yeah. What that mean? Yeah, because of the EIN. Yeah, you would have because of the EIN. So remember, that QuickBooks is all based on entities, right? Your S Corp is an entity unto itself with its own tax ID. You personally are an entity unto yourself with your own social security number. Okay. Now, we can use the class coding to keep them separate, but it's not ideal from a tax filing perspective, right? Because his personal is getting commingled with his business side of things. And so, my recommendation is always to keep the two separate entities separate. The one except he could. And that's why I said the class coding is the way to do that. Class coding is just a little bit different. It, it, it makes the class gives us the ability to look at three separate entities within the same setup. Okay. Um, an example would be a winery with multiple tasting rooms, three separate locations that we're tracking those expenses against. I was class, so we had a tasting room here, we had a tasting room in Lompoc, 
the tasting room and pass. So all, all three had three separate classes that they were associated with that I could track those expenses separate from everything else. They are perceived and can be tracked as entities within QuickBooks. It's just not ideal. So yes to your question. It absolutely can you be. Can run a P &L on uh -huh. on right. Correct, because you'd have class A for one group, class B for the second group, and class C. And so when you run to run it, you would run it under the class itself. No. And see, that's where I get, because people do uh, all the time. And it, it's a nightmare, because what they end up doing is they get to the end of the year, they go to the CPA, and the CPA is like, uh-uh. Go figure this out. And you know who they come to? They come to me and go, please help me untangle this. And it's like spaghetti. I mean, that's the only way to describe it. It's horrific. It really is. And then it's like, okay, let's not let this happen again. So if I was to schedule one-on-one with you, you could help me quick person. Absolutely. Not a problem at all. Okay, cool. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Yeah. We're all good. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending today. Just a friendly reminder, we will be doing an advanced class, and Madison will be sending, um, getting the email addresses. I will be sending out both the presentation today and the learning guide. Again, if you have any questions, concerns, or do you want to set up a one-on-one -on -one with me, please don't hesitate to reach out, um, and we can set something up. And thank you again for attending my class today.